Hey, great. Um, I am excited to be here with you all. Um, and what I'd like to do before we really focus in on Coptic church histories, I'd like to set the scene. So we're going to take a look at what happens, uh, we're gonna do a big picture, what happens, um, what's happening in the world in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, what's happening in the Western church, what's happening in the region and the regional churches before we really um, delve into Egypt. Um, and I want to do it that way because the things that are happening, I want us to be able to see that the things and the changes that are happening in Egypt and Egypt's church um, are influenced by what's happening in the world, by, and especially by what's happening in the region and other neighboring churches. Um, and also, I don't think we're used to doing history this way. I think we are used to um, focusing on the Coptic church specifically, and then we're not able to um, really put that back into the bigger picture. So I'm gonna start off with the bigger picture today. Um, if you can, if you're ready to turn the slide, we're ready to, thank you. Okay, so um, what I really wanna focus on too is the encounter between East and West um, because uh, the Academy today likes to bifurcate the two worlds. Um, and again, I wanna focus on what's happening in the world and um, how, where Egypt fits into this, where Egypt's church fits into this and how it fits into this. Um, and I wanna see, I want us to be able to see that the encounter between East and West is part and parcel of the, um, the grand narrative of history. And we could even go so far as to say the economy of salvation um, and how that this encounter between East and West, how it affected both parties. So without further ado, let's go into what is happening in the world. Um, the events of this time of the 18th and 19th century shape the Western mind, these events plus the Renaissance, um, shape the Western mind for the, the Western mind that we encounter today is a product of, of all of these events. Um, so I know that last week, or sorry, the last lecture, Andrew discussed the Reformation um, now, the Reformation leads to the Counter-Reformation um, and the introduction of the so-called Enlightenment, um, which segues into the season of revolutions. We see agricultural uh, revolution, industrial, the American and French revolutions. And again, all these in events inform Western secular society. And ironically so that it all begins with the Reformation. Now the Reformation introduces a vastly different worldview than the medieval world. Um, and it's one that pierces the very fabric of human society. We see with the Reformation, the introduction of individualism and the slow death of community. Um, now, before I move on to talk about the enlightenment, um, I do wanna bring your attention to the encounter between Martin Luther and the patriarch Jeremiah II of Constantinople. Um, they did correspond. I think it was about three letters that were exchanged back and forth. And this is the first dialogue that we see in church history between the Eastern Orthodox churches and the Protestant churches. It's also known as the Greek Augsburg uh, Confession, um, which if any of you are interested in further reading, I encourage you to look that up. So moving on to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is a philosophical movement that perpetuates the ideas that the individual is to live for his or herself um, according to reason and rationality rather than the myths and legends that are preached on the pulpit. They advocated liberty, scientific progress, tolerance, fraternity, and the separation of church and state, um, constitutional government, and the equality of all citizens. Now, uh, one thing we can take away from the Enlightenment is Descartes' statement, cognito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Um, this saying or this uh, philosophy, this way of life becomes entrenched in hearts and minds um, 
which then again segues nicely into the uh, agricultural and industrial revolution, which further cements an individualistic lifestyle uh, that has been the cornerstone of Western society ever since. Um, it, the industrial revolution creates a economy that is based on technology and industry and manufacturing. Now, the Seven Years' War between Britain and France lasts for, for seven years from 1756 to 1763. Um, and each power, Britain and France, are both vying for global domination. Um, it's a conflict that spans five different, con five different continents with uh, the major world powers, again, being Britain and France, fighting over colonies in the new world. And this fight embroils Spain, it involves Sweden, Austria, and Russia. And again, each of them are vying for the best global territories. Um, it's at this time that the French claims Canada and the British uh, the 13 colonies. The Treaty of Paris, which is signed in 1963, marks the end of the Seven Years' War, and that drew colonial lines largely in favor of the British um, and removes all other European rivals for westward expansion. This outcome would later influence France, Spain, and the Netherlands to intervene in the American War for Independence, um, which brings us to the Revolutionary War, which we call the Revolutionary War in the United States, that begins in 1775 and ends in 1783. And then with, um, with the other European rivals for power, this quickly becomes a transatlantic conflict, again, something that is new for the human narrative. The French Revolution then lasts from 1787 to 1799, ironically inspired by the American Revolution. Um, and it, it completely changes the relationship between rulers and those they rule. Um, the nature of political power as we know it from this moment on is, is completely different. And it introduces um, what it means to rule for the modern world. And this is interesting because here we see inspiration traveling far and wide. And um, while it's not new for this period, it's still important because the French Revolution instills idea of what, ideas of what it means to be a citizen, um, which will reverberate in the Ottoman East. Technological advances abound, um, economies rise and fall, trade sees unprecedented growth uh, thanks to the rise of industry and technology. Increases in wealth, uh, goods produced, and the standard of living drive the world into what is called, what historians like to call the pre-modern era. Uh, the world order of empire is threatened in this period because nationalism dominates political discourse. And again, after the Enlightenment and the French Revolution in particular, um, they eventually create the modern day borders we know today at the end of World War I, which we'll get to in our next lecture on the 20th century. Um, so we'll get into the world wars next time. But now let's turn our attention to two prominent thinkers, uh, Charles Darwin and his half cousin, Francis Galton, before we move on to what is happening in the Western church. So in 1859, Darwin, Darwin publishes On the Origin of Species, where he expounds the theory of evolution and that populations can change over generations. This work gains unprecedented popularity. Uh, people begin to speculate what it could mean for humanity to push his theory further and further. Uh, his work made a case for common descent, providing evidence of homologies between humans and mammals, but he avoided an explicit discussion of human origins um, in this first work. He does, however, hint that sexual selection could explain differences in race. Darwin went on to publish The Descent of Man in 1871, um, and in that work he explicitly uses the word evolution. Um, now, Darwin's first publication on the origin of species in 1859 influences his, again, half cousin, Francis Galton, um, his own publication. So after Francis Galton reads on the origin of species, he devotes his entire life to studying the difference of races um, of humanity. And 
the implications that those variations have. So he was also very interested in the question of hereditary ability. Um, he publishes his work, Hereditary Genius, in 1869. Um, later on in his career, he introduces the word eugenics in 1883. So main takeaways from these events are that church life is no longer the center of communal life. Uh, religion is dismissed as myth. It's dismissed as um, unscientific. And an agricultural driven economy gives way to a more industrial one. So the things that once were slowly, uh, once were, are slowly being designated as medieval. Um, so if we could turn to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a look at what's happening in the global church in the West. So as we mentioned before, the counter reformation is the Catholic church's resurgence attempt to respond to the reformation. Now this leads to inquisition, persecution, and suppression of all non-Catholic religious practices. Um, the Catholic, which means that um, Orthodox living in Europe, for example, um, their religious practices are suppressed. They are not, no longer tolerated. The Catholic church expended efforts in all parts of its universal church. Um, and it does this in many different ways. So again, in the 18th and 19th centuries, we're talking about the tail end of the counter reformation. Um, and what that means or what that includes is that the Catholic church is sending out missions to reconvert countries who were Catholic historically, but quote unquote lost to the Protestant Reformation. This suppression of non-Catholic religious activity ends in the year 1781 with um, the Habsburg Emperor Joseph II issuing the Patent of Toleration. But it's not until 1861 that the Protestant Church gains equivalent legal status to the Catholic Church in Austria. Now, with all this, the Catholic Church begins a new method of dealing with the East, which again, we will see when we talk about regional churches. Um, and that is of mission. And we're talking about mission versus the medieval method of crusade. The idea that these lands were... Um, were lost to the universal church by Islam and you have to go militarily reconquer them. Um, the church, so now that secular thought and reason are entrenched in European thought, European princes no longer respond to the Pope's call to crusade. These European princes would also rather make alliances with the, new, with the by this time, newly formed Ottoman Empire. Um, so the church then adapts and follows suit. In 1622, the Catholic cardinals uh, form the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. And this committee or congregation, if you will, um, it travels far and wide. Uh, they're quite active all throughout the 18th century in the East. Uh, they send out delegations um, calling for union with Rome. Uh, calling for the Eastern Church's repentance in not having union with Rome, um, and the things that the Eastern Churches have to adapt in order to be properly united with Rome. So while that's still happening, Vatican I is held, and Vatican I is held from 1869 to 1870. And this is important for a few reasons. The first being that the last Roman Catholic ecumenical council, that the ecumenical council of the Roman Catholic Church recognizes is the Council of Trent. And the Council of Trent was held from 1545 to 1563. It's a good 300 years before Vatican I. Um, now Vatican I's first session is held on June 29th, 1869. Um, and then the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War leads to the interruption of the council. Um, the council is never, in fact, fully resumed and it's never officially closed. 
as in other councils at which the Pope is present and presided, the decrees were in the form of papal bulls, um, at the end of which was the clear declaration, quote, with the approval of the sacred council, end quote. Uh, very large numbers attend Vatican I, including for the first time bishops from outside of Europe and its neighboring lands. Bishops, this is interesting that bishops from the Eastern Orthodox Church were invited, uh, but they did not, um, they did not make it to Rome. So the council is also important because it spells out the doctrine of papal infallibility. It was called to discuss papal primacy, papal supremacy, and papal infallibility in a region, in a very splintered Italy. Um, Rome is again vying for unity among the Italian states with Rome as its primary leader, um, which is a tactic that we do see with Rome's interaction with the Eastern churches. So this is all sparked by Pope Pius, I believe it's Pius IV, um, his 18, 54 Declaration of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary um, as dogma. How we get to the Immaculate Conception of Mary has a lot to do with how, um, how sin is viewed in the Catholic Church and how justification is viewed in the Catholic Church. Um, and the concept of That nothing is impossible for God. So if God could do something, he or he should do something. He would do something. So he did it. That 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 line of of logic. Um, and so if sin means death, um, and it's like that for all of humanity, but it can't possibly mean that for Saint Mary. So Christ would or God would make an exception for her so that she would not be um, subject to the guilt of original sin. Um, so I hope I hope by saying all this that I'm pointing out that the, the Catholic world view leads to this type of doctrine. Um, oh, sorry, can you go back to the Netflix slide? Thank you. So uh, rumors start to circle Europe before the council. Um, and that revealed that papal infallibility was on the agenda and that the attendees of the council were already in agreement to vote for papal infallibility um, and to push it forward as dogma. Now, factions around the proposal arose um, across Europe and some Italians even proposed setting up a rival council in Naples. Um, Again, this goes to show that papal infallibility was not something that all Catholics were comfortable with. Um, however, before the council met, the invitation about its whereabouts became very vague. Um, but at Vatican I, about 10% of the bishops opposed the proposed definition of papal infallibility on both ecclesiastical and pragmatic grounds. Um, because in their opinion, it departs from the ecclesial structure of the early church. From a pragmatic perspective, they feared that defining papal infallibility would alienate some Catholics. It would create new difficulties for union with non-Catholics, uh, which we do see in the East, and it would provoke interference by governments in ecclesiastical affairs. Those who held this view included uh, most of the German and Austro-Hungarian bishops, nearly half of the um, the American bishops, one third of the French, and most of the Chaldeans and Melkites and a few of the Armenians, because again, this does not, um, this dogma or this belief being pushed as dogma is ultimately strange to the Eastern Christian worldview. Only a few bishops appear to have had doubts about the dogma itself. Um, this, these concerns about the dogma were indeed founded um, as various attempts with union with the Eastern churches. Um, the doctrine of papal infallibility was a stumbling block in the way of union. Um, it did very often get in the way of union with Rome. So let's move on to what is happening in the region. Um, this is a very, very um, 
there are a lot of difficult things to grapple with in the region, lots of, lots of changes. So the Thimmi status, which means the, um, the non-Muslim protected status of, again, non-Muslims living in uh, the Dar al-Islam or the House of, of Islam um, is being threatened. So the Ottoman millet system had been in place since the Ottomans conquered Constantinople in 1453. It's the basis of all Muslim social sensibilities. Um, it's a way to ensure, to give limited autonomy and to ensure um, non-Muslims as being societally inferior to Muslims. So your religion dictated your milla, right, which is Arabic for group. And so that's the way in which the Ottomans administrated separate religious communities. Again, the system allows for a degree of limited autonomy in ensuring the communities, uh, again, limited authority in overseeing its own communal affairs. These communal affairs pertain largely to personal status laws, laws that had to do with um, inheritance and marriage and divorce primarily. So in practice, what this does is ensure that the me status is maintained among many non-Muslim groups. So whenever, historically, whenever this balance was upset, um, so were Ottoman sensibilities, so were Muslim sensibilities to begin with. Um, lootings and riots often against these um, non-Muslim elements would tip the scales back in favor of, of balance. Um, and note that this is one of the, the reasons why the Armenian genocide happened. Um, so the Tanzimat reforms, or uh, maybe we can recognize this from Arabic Tanzim, um, it means reorganization. Uh, the Tanzimat reforms were a series of reforms promulgated in the Ottoman Empire between 1839 and 1876 under the reigns of Sultans Abdul Hamid I and Abdul Aziz. Um, these reforms are heavily influenced by European ideas. They're intended to effectuate a fundamental change of the empire uh, from the old system which is based on theocratic principles, on religious principles, to that of a modern state. The Tanzimat sought to consolidate the social and political foundations of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the most famous decree is the 1839 decree, um, and it enforces the rule of law for all subjects. So all subjects are equal in the rule of law at this time. There are no exceptions. Um, they are all guaranteed to the right to life and uh, property for all. So this actually puts an end to what is called the Dhul system, right? Which allows um, a ruler's servants to be executed or their property to be confiscated at his will. A practice that was used a lot against non-Muslim elements of the Ottoman Empire. Um, or anywhere really, <laughs> anywhere where um, the state was based on Islamic theocratic principles. So for the first time in the history of Islam, non-Muslims have the right of equality and equal to Muslims. The, so the Tanzimat reforms seek to put an end to the millet system. Um, which again created rel religiously based communities that operated autonomously. Some of these groups received privileges, some more than others, um, which we'll get to. So while this is a move towards a more secular society in theory, the practice lags behind. Um, some of the ways these groups received privileges was through conversion to Eastern Catholic churches, uh, which we'll gloss over in the next section when we talk about regional churches. Um, what we'll say here is that when Near Eastern Christians convert to Western versions of Christianity, it creates a serious tension between 
the converts because they now have a little bit more power and protection by an alien, i.e. non-Ottoman and Christian government. Um, so even if the Tan Tanzimat reforms took a while to practice on the ground versus how quickly they were to be introduced, these Christians and the governments behind them, which are mainly France and Britain, um, sought to demolish the Mistaris, an example of the far wide influence again of the French Revolution. And the, this social imbalance is ultimately uh, very offensive to Ottoman sensibilities. Um, what is also very offensive is that Greece, the country that we know today uh, in the Eastern Aegean, gains independence at this time. Um, the struggle for independence lasts about eight years. And it's important for this time period because Greece is one of the first countries on the European continent to resist Ottoman rule. Um, the Greeks are aided by the Russians. The Greek church is very much at the center of this struggle. Um, the Russians fashion themselves as the protectors of all Orthodox Christians under Ottoman rule. Um, and keep in mind also that the uh, the Russo-Turkish wars are happening on and off throughout, I'd say mainly the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, the French, again, the French fashion themselves as the um, protectors of all Catholics in the Ottoman Empire and the British as the protectors of all Protestants in the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Ottomans who are fighting against the Greeks are supported by uh, the Egyptian fleet, who is led by Muhammad Ali, um, who we'll get to when we talk about Egypt. Um, but after Greece gains independence, the Ottoman Empire is nervous about losing more precious territory in the Balkans, in Europe, their strongholds um, in Europe, because those are previously what allowed them to get all the way up to the siege of Vienna in 1683. So Greek independence seriously... Um, squashes, we could say, squashes Ottoman ambitions for territory in Europe. Now, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, we'll take a look at what happens in the regional churches. Um, so there are new movements that change the quote unquote ecumenical scene um, as a result of Catholic missions in the East. The Melkite Greek Catholic Church is established in 1724 in Aleppo, Syria. Before that, the Greek church in Syria had, since the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, 1453, long been under Greek-speaking leadership. So all services and liturgies are held in Greek, and the pastoral care for an Arabic-speaking congregation is non-existent. So in Arabic-speaking, Orthodox Christians began to be employed by the French consulate as dragomans or as translators. Um, Dragomans doesn't really, the word uh, translators doesn't really um, give us the whole effect of what these people did for the Ottoman state. Um, the Ottomans themselves considered it un-Islamic to learn Western customs and Western languages. And so that opened up an opportunity for Ottoman Christians to learn French, English, uh, they learned Persian, Arabic, and Turkish too, to be able to rise to these diplomatic positions. Um, and rise they did. Again, these positions are seen as uh, un-Islamic. So you don't have too many Muslims taking on these, like, am I think ambassador is a better word for a, a dragoman. Um, so again, foreign powers, mainly France, if we're talking about the establishment of all these Catholic communities, um, they offer the dragomans political protection according to something called the capitulation system. So in the Ottoman Empire, when you had lots of different foreign people living there, um, and Ottoman rule or the Ottoman law is so foreign to their sensibilities, they worked out a, an agreement that um, they would have, in, they would instead be ruled by their own country's laws while residing in uh, Istanbul or Ottoman territories. They mainly reside in Istanbul. 
So what this means is members of the newly established Greek church become French citizens versus Ottoman Christians, um, and they escape the millet system or the system that ensures the societal balance between Christians and Muslims. Um, this is a sweeping trend at this time, as you can see with these dates, um, the, the Catholics kind of go in, and especially in the Greek church, this is where we see the beginnings of, um, we can almost call it Arabic nationalism, right? The Catholics go in to the Arabic speaking Orthodox Christians and they say, you know, none of your services are in Arabic and they're all in Greek and they kind of, um, they kind of spark this, you should have, um, you have the right to have services um, in your own language. You have the right to have ecclesial hierarchy that um, will serve you better than the Greek speaking clergy. So especially with the Greek Catholic or the Melkite church, um, we definitely see the beginnings of an Arabic identity right? It, even if here we see it, it in the church, this is where it, it happens. Um, again, in the region, this happens in 1895 in Egypt, which is, is fairly late to the game because Egypt resisted um, a lot of calls to union with Rome. And uh, you have the establishment of the Armenian Catholic Church in 1742 and the Syriac Catholic Church in 1782. Um, with the establishment of these churches, what it allows, again, is for political protection by France, but also to keep their own Eastern customs and liturgics and um, languages, but have protection of the union with Rome. So you get to keep the Eastern customs, be under French political rule and the ecclesial protection of the Church of Rome, the best of all worlds, really. Um, this pattern then becomes a new tactic that the Church of Rome employs in the name of union, as you can see with all these dates on the screen. Um, to the result, which you have a very splintered Christianity in the East. So with the um, establishment of these churches, these churches are established with the help of the French state and the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the people who join these churches are politically protected by France, which has never happened, right? So they're basically Ottomans that are now protected by France. And they're also protected by the Church of Rome, which is its own state. So it's protected by two Western states. And that upsets the social balance of that Christians can't be more powerful than Muslims. Um, for the first time in, in Islamic history, uh, this, this thing has happened where Western powers are backing Eastern Christians and giving them rights that they would not have otherwise. Does that answer your question? I just wanna make sure this part's really clear. You mean that, the, that for the first time in Islam history, the, the the Catholic powers are back with what? Those who convert to the, these Catholic churches are backed by the French state and the Roman Catholic Church. They, they have the protections offered by those two powers versus, for example, uh, the Coptic Orthodox, they would not have, um, they could not, um, have access to French citizenship or protection of Rome in, in diplomatic, um, diplomatic ties. Okay, so let's come to Egypt now. Um, we're in the period of late Ottoman rule um, in Egypt. We can move to the next slide, thank you. And we have it's a very interesting time in Egypt. Um, so the, the later Ottomans establish power or set up their administration in Egypt in such a way where they're trying to keep a very delicate balance of power. So that way um, no Ottoman Pesha, for example, or a governor of Egypt could rise up and take Egypt away from the Ottoman empire. Um, so 
there are three people or three um, three rivals to keep a balance of power is the Besha of Egypt and his responsibility is to um, collect all the taxes and his term is kept short so he doesn't have time to grow roots in Egypt or so the people don't love him and ask for him to be their ruler. Um, Two, the army garrison had its own independent council, so an independent army. And three, uh, the Mamluks who ruled Egypt from 1250 to 1517 are still ruling Egypt um, or they're governors of Egypt uh, or what they're called bays. So there's a Besha, one Ottoman Besha, and then there are Mamluk bays. They're under the Ottoman Besha, but they essentially are ruling the country. Um, So what ends up happening though, is these Mamluk bays are each trying to gain power. Um, there's a lot of fighting in between them. Um, and sometimes they straight up reject the Besha who's sent by Istanbul. And, um, and then, you know, on the one hand, the Sultan in Istanbul doesn't want a Besha in Egypt for too long for the reasons I just mentioned. So in the 272 years, between the rule of Sultan Selim I from 1215 to the advent of Napoleon in 1798, there were 110 Ottoman Beshas who served as governors of Egypt for Istanbul. Um, so during this period, we learn of three very interesting Coptic figures. Uh, the first is Ibrahim al Guhari. He is favored by, uh, he was employed by a Mamluk Bey named Ibrahim, um, and he makes him his minister of finance. So he controls and manages not only the private property of the Bey, uh, which consists mostly of tax farms, but he also um, manages the public income and expenditure. He was a de facto chief of the Supreme Revenue Office in Ottoman Egypt. And he's the director of the Corporation of Tax Collectors and State Scribes who administered the finances of the entire country. Um, these types of positions were held almost exclusively by cops in the 17th century. They actually develop uh, a system where the uh, finance officer would teach his nephew everything he knew about the office and he would teach it to him um, using the Coptic or he'd teach him a system that they'd coded using Coptic letters which to the um, the Arabic bays they didn't understand this and they called it a very like uh, a cryptic system so they just did this in the way to keep it like in the family and for them to um, to keep training and to keep these positions for themselves. So we know a lot from Ibrahim al-Gohari from the Muslim historian al-Jabarti, right? And he calls Ibrahim al-Gohari the most influential, influential and capable personalities of his time. He's a person who deals with everyone properly and who acquired sympathy on all sides through his charity and his generosity. Um, he has a very deferential attitude to political leaders, and he makes a lot of gifts to people in power, and that earns him their friendship and their support. His influence among the dominant class was so great that he's able to construct, restore, and maintain Coptic churches and monasteries, which you can read about in his um, Synaxarian entry. Um, and his actions are, he's also he also makes, um, friends among the ulama or the religious chief justices. Um, now again, Muslim resistance against this, what they call the Coptic Renaissance of self-confidence um, is stirred during the Ottoman expedition of Hassan Besha. So Hassan Besha is the Ottoman Besha sent to Egypt in 1786 to quell the fighting, the infighting between all the different bays in Egypt, the Mamluk bays. So Hassan Besha sees that Christians have risen to these high ranks um, 
And remember, it's the same thing that's happening in the empire and in Istanbul. Um, and the reaction of the Ottomans is to quell this quote unquote Christian haughtiness. Um, Ibrahim al Gohari dies in 1795. Um, and even though it's improper for a, a Muslim to do so, his bay, Ibrahim Bay, um, didn't refrain from giving him the best funeral he could. And he, uh, he walks in his funeral, which is a very big deal in this uh, area. Um, Ibrahim al Gohari leaves the Coptic Patriarchate a lot of real estate, um, especially in the Azbekeya quarter of Cairo. And he's also able to obtain official permission to start building a church there, uh, which his brother, then Girgis al Gohari, um, completed. The Coptic Patriarch, Mark VIII, transferred his residence to the Azbeke, so that becomes the seat of the Coptic Patriarchate. Ibrahim's brother, Girgis, is his successor, so he becomes the chief of, um, of the Dewans of the last two Mamluks of Egypt, Ibrahim Bey and Murad Bey. And their fighting against each other also brings about the decline in power for both of them. Um, and then we are introduced to the French expedition to Egypt. Now, the French expedition only lasts three years, as you can see on the screen. It lasts from 1798 to 1801. Um, it is led by Napoleon Bonaparte and his General Keebler. And what this does, this proves to be a monumental event in, in the history of Egypt and history of modern Egypt, because for the first time since the Crusades, Egypt has an official uh, connection or official contact with a European country uh, that doesn't exactly include war. Right? Napoleon Bonaparte comes to establish a Middle Eastern empire under the pretext of um, the defense of Islam a reversal of what the Crusades sought to do. So in doing so, he exposed Egypt to Western thought, to Western uh, politics, and he affected every phase of Egyptian life to varying degrees. Um, now for the world, this is important uh, for the rest of the world because his discovery of the Rosetta Stone in 1799 decodes Egyptian hieroglyphics through demotic script and the study of Coptic. So they employ Coptic priests to take a look at the Demotic script and then um, other Orientalists are able to finally decode Egyptian hieroglyphics, which were um, a mystery to the rest of the world until this time. Now, um, Girgis al Gawahri writes to Napoleon in 1798, he appeals to him for liberty, equality, and fraternity, which was the cry of the French Revolution, um, and to life for the disabilities of the cops and to give them full measure of equality with their Muslim brother, with their Muslim brothers. It's a very, very, very brave uh, thing to do, especially because he does this a good 30 years before the Tanzimat reforms are introduced. Um, and we can consider that since this point, uh, Islam at this point considers Christians not as not only as the Ni or Ahl al Kitab, it considers them as infidels, as kuffar. Um, and it had developed an Islamic elitism that's evident in, in every class. Napoleon's initial response is favorable to Girgis, um, but he never did sacrifice the interest of the Muslim majority for the sake of the Coptic minority. Um, because Napoleon and many of his French soldiers uh, posed as Muslim to gain the trust of Egyptians. Um, but again, the cops are widely used in administration. Some of them rise up to high office. Um, Girgis al was, um was appointed again to a key position in the control of taxation. Um, and especially after the flight of the Mamluk Bays from the French. So while exact, cops were not exactly favored by their French co-religionists, uh, they were not subject to repression at this period. Um, another interesting figure I'd like to bring attention to is General Ya'oub, and he lives um, between the year 1745, he dies in 1801. Um, 
His career is a prelude to an independent Egypt, neither Turkish nor French. Uh, he's interesting because during this period when the uh, Ottomans are trying to quell the resistance of the Mamluk Bays, uh, or they're trying to keep them from fighting each other, uh, General Ya'ub creates a Coptic legion, a Coptic army as a form of resistance. And it's the first time that Copts are officially armed in Egypt. Um, because this, again, is a stipulation of demi life under Islam. So, As the Turks had broken the Treaty of Al Arish, Keebler, Napoleon's general, was doing battle with the Turks at Heliopolis. Um, some of their cavalry slipped into Cairo and roused the population. Now, when this happens, the non Muslim elements of society are the ones that it's in general just a pattern. Um, the non Muslim societal elements are the ones to suffer. So the Coptic quarter is the target for attacks by an enraged mob led by Hassan Bey and Jadawi. Um, so instead of fleeing to old Cairo and asking for the protection of the Turks as some rich cops did do, what General Ya'ub did is that he barricaded himself and defended his quarter during 20 days of fighting. Um, and then after these days, uh, were over, his 20 days were over, Keebler decreed that all cops should remain in their quarter, and those who fled to old Cairo um, were forced to return to their homes. So if his house had been burned or otherwise destroyed, a family was to be received into the nearest house. And ya uh, General Yakub was charged with the, ex the execution of this order, and he is given the title, the Ara, of the Coptic nation. Um, and the French gave him 30 troops for his own personal security and to ensure um, French respect for his authority as era of the Coptic nation. Um, the Coptic League, again, is an outcome of this resistance. It's distinguished from other auxiliary units um, within the French army by Napoleon. Um, and it was born of the need of self-defense. And it gives expression to a national vocation. So Ya'ub had, General uh, Ya'ub had a fortress built with towers and ramparts um, like those around the city. In Cairo and Upper Egypt, he goes and recruits young Copts um, who are then instructed by and trained by French soldiers. The legion was to consist of six companies to be augmented um, as a sufficient number of men presented themselves. By September 23rd uh, of the year 1800, 896 men, including officers, um, were recruited. This seems to be the largest number that was attained for a Coptic legion. Um, and it does seem that the um, that Ya'ub, even on his deathbed, had hoped that the European powers would help free Egypt of what he thought was an escapable system put, um, of the the Ottomans versus the Mamluks. He's an interesting character for looking at resistance this way, um, and. He does something that has never been done before. Um, so while Egyptian history at this time is quite obscure, what these three men, Ibrahim and Girgis al gawahri and General Ya'ub, uh, what they do provides some light. The French finally withdraw from Egypt in 1801. Um, and as a result, the cops fell on bad times because the Ottomans saw what they thought was their ambition uh, to rule their country or to begin to rule their country and because they were also Christians and the French were Christians. Um, so the Ottomans didn't really distinguish between who was Eastern Christian and what those sensibilities were and Western Christians. Um, conditions improved four years later with the emergence of Muhammad Ali Besha in 1805. Um, 
to whom cops proved indispensable in carrying out his reform agenda and keeping the administrative, the Islamic administrative tradition since the beginning of the early Middle Ages. Um, Muhammad Ali was an outstanding soldier and statesman. He's the, what's called the founder of uh, modern Egypt. He finds a dynasty that rules Egypt until 1952, until the Free Officers um, Revolution led by Muhammad Naguib and Gamal Abdel Nasser. So during the French invasion of Egypt in 1798, Muhammad Ali is sent by the Ottoman Sultan in Istanbul um, to lead a force of contingent Macedonian Albanians and he's their officer. And after they defeat the French and the French leave Egypt in 1801, Muhammad Ali stays on to watch the ensuing confusion and struggle for power between the Mamluks and the Ottoman governor and the Egyptian people. Um, and so he exploits this situation for his own benefit. In 1805, he wins the confidence of the, um, the ulama, right? The Muslim jurists. Um, and they ask him to become their ruler. And so then he has the Sultan confirm him as governor or as Wali of Egypt. So a little bit more permanent than the position of Pesha that we talked about before. Um, so once he's Wali of Egypt, he's subsequently able to get rid of his rivals and become the unchallenged master of the country. It takes six years to get rid of the Mamluk Bey's, but he finally does this by inviting them all to an elaborate state dinner at the Cairo Citadel, um, which he then proceeds to lock all the doors and just massacre all of the Mamluks. Um, and then at that point, he and his Albanian troops go on an, uh, on an indiscriminate slaughter of the Mamluks throughout all of Egypt. So once he's leader of Egypt, he sets out to transform Egypt into a powerful state that's self-sufficient, right? He's watching the industrial revolution halfway across the world or you know, in Europe, and he is watching the agricultural revolution. He wants to bring all these technologies and all this industry to Egypt to propel it to modernity. Um, he rebuilds an army, he rebuilds the navy, um, which he had resounding successes and victories all around Egypt as he's trying to establish Egypt as an autonomous state. He extends his influence to the Arabian Peninsula, to the Sudan, uh, to Syria, Crete, and Anatolia, where he upsets the, again, the Ottoman, the political Ottoman balance in the area. So with their interests seriously threatened, um, the foreign powers again of British, uh, the British and the French intervene. And in 1840, Muhammad Ali's vast empire is reduced to Egypt and the Sudan. Um, he's also given in 1840, he's given hereditary rule of Egypt. So the, the Ottoman Sultan recognizes him as a serious rival and threat and gives him to rule Egypt autonomously. So Egypt, um, once again becomes a center of its own empire and he just has to check in with Istanbul every now and again. Muhammad Ali dies in uh, 1849 and his son Ibrahim um, dies before him in 1848. What is important is that several eminent cops stand out in Muhammad Ali's favor rendering him services in finance and administration. The most notable among them, his name is Mohamed Ghali, uh, who carried out a survey of the whole country and he divided it into provinces, each with its own capital and smaller subdivisions for the purpose of an efficient revenue assessment. It's also believed that Ghali suggested to Muhammad Ali the idea of linking the Mediterranean and the Red Sea by the means of a canal, a project to be financed principally by the Egyptian capital, uh, by Egyptian capital, sorry. And yet yeah, as is the case of a lot of people um, who are close to Muhammad Ali, um, he 
Muhammad, or sorry, uh, Muallim Ghali falls victim to a campaign of intrigue that results in Muhammad Ali twice exiling him um, and twice reinstating him until he's eventually killed in 1821. Um, his son Basilius succeeds him as Auditor General of Accounts and had the title of Bey confirmed upon him, and he's the first cop to achieve the title of Bey. Butrus Ara Armanius had been previously the governor of the province of Girga in Upper Egypt during the French occupation, is appointed governor of Wedi Bordis, and he's given a free hand to restore law and order. So this is an unprecedented amount of power that these cops are coming upon. Um, Farah Ara and Makram Ara, also two cops, are assigned similar offices in, uh, in Fesh and Etfiah respectively. So as a result of cops becoming more qualified, a lot of them distinguish themselves as administrators, engineers, surveyors, accounters, uh, scribes, and translators. And in recognition of their services and cooperation in implementing these reform projects, Muhammad Ali issued various decrees authorizing cops to have new churches and to have the older ones restored. So Muhammad Ali's reign coincides with the reign of Patriarch Peter, um, almost his entire patriarchal career, right, from 1809 to 1852. Um, Patriarch Peter is born in El Jawli. He enters St. Anthony's Monastery at an early age, and he's later selected to become Metropolitan of Ethiopia. Um, for some reason, his formal consecration for Ethiopia does not happen, or it's postponed, and instead he's raised to the rank of Bishop General, and he remains in Cairo to assist Patriarch Mark VIII, who was Patriarch before him, um, from 1796 to 1809. So when Patriarch Mark VIII dies, uh, shortly afterwards, Peter's immediately chosen to success him and, and to succeed him, and he's enthroned. Um, and he's endowed with the qualities of a true man of God. Um, in the Coptic literature, he's likened to John the Baptist a lot. Um, he's humble, patient, he's self-denying, he's simple in his attire, and he's frugal in his meals. So he leads a, a, type of, a life of total renunciation, and he concentrates on the study of theology and church history. He writes a number of tracts um, which expound the position of the Coptic Church on the subjects of Holy Communion, the nature of Christ, and other treaties, other treatises where he admonishes those who seek conversion to the Coptic, or sorry, to the Catholic creed or to the Protestant, um, or who respond positive, positively to the, the Protestant missionaries in Egypt at this time. Peter's reign is marked by a number of in, of um, interesting miraculous episodes um, which are accepted by the Coptic community of the faithful as true occurrences in spite of their ostensibly legendary nature as I'm sure you can tell from what I'm about to recount. Um, first is that the Nile flood failed for one year and the people asked the patriarch to pray for the resumption of the inundation of the Nile. So after receiving Holy Communion, Peter washed the sacramental utensils and sprinkled that water into the river, and then the Nile River speedily began to rise. A similar episode again is recorded in the 8th century during the reign of Patriarch um, Michael I. And then during the, page, uh, the reign of Muhammad Ali, his son Ibrahim Besha is governor of Syria, and it said that he was have summoned Peter to Jerusalem and challenged him to prove the miracle of the holy fire, which illumines the holy sepulcher in Jerusalem every feast of the resurrection. So after a three-day fast of, uh, he observes a three-day three -day fast and he prays, Patriarch Peter celebrates Holy Communion in the presence of Ibrahim Besha and the Greek Orthodox Patriarch when a powerful light floods the tomb of Christ. The third miracle is that, and I wouldn't call this a miracle, I would say that this um, rather brings Patriarch Peter a lot of favor. So again, we talked earlier about how the Russian Orthodox Church saw itself as the protector of all Orthodox Christians in Ottoman lands. So 
a Russian uh, consul pays Peter a visit for the purpose of offering the Tsar of Russia's protection to the Coptic community. Um, Peter retorted that the Copts would rather not be protected by an earthly power, but they are protected by the immortal power of God. Um, this episode then uh, makes Muhammad Ali uh, favor him. And favor him and allow uh, Christians to rebuild their churches. Um, the history of the patriarchs talks about a very interesting uh, incident with Patriarch Peter. Um, it's a story of a daughter of Muhammad Ali. Her name was Zahra Hanem. She said to have been possessed by a demon and she suffered from fits of convulsion um, that the physicians failed to treat. So Muhammad Ali, resorts to Peter, who summoned the saintly Bishop of Munafeya, Abu Sar Bumon, or who we know today as Abu Sar Bumon Abu Tarhar. The Bishop goes to the palace, he prays on a basin of water, he sprinkles it on the face of the sick lady while commanding the evil spirit in the name of Jesus to depart from her. Um, and she's at once, she recovers miraculously. So the Khedev in the recognition of this feat awards the Bishop 4,000 gold pieces, which the bishop refused to accept. When the Khedev insisted, the bishop only took a few gold coins that he distributed to the guards as he leaves the royal palace. Um, he does, however, request to reinstate Coptic state employees, and that is granted to him as a result of this. So the rule of Muhammad Ali ushers in a very new and interesting uh, rule for the Coptic church. Um, Egypt, once again, is at the center of the empire. So before it's the center of the empire, it was under the Armenian Orthodox millet at Istanbul. Um, and a lot of its affairs were, um, took a while for them to take care of, right? If the Coptic Patriarchate had to appeal to the Armenian Patriarchate in Istanbul for everything. Um, there are two other dates that are important to remember for this period is the 1882 Arabi revolt, um, which marks the first nationalistic Egyptian uh, effort to gain control over Egypt, over the Egyptian rule, which actually ends up in um, stronger British rule for Egypt, which I will get into the next, um, the next lecture, we'll, I'll begin with that. Um, and then again, 1895 is the, the official start date for the Coptic Catholic Church. Um, I'm just pointing that out there because this is quite, um, quite late. Um, and then one figure, again, we'll have to relegate to the next lecture, um, is the Patriarch Cyril IV. He is Patriarch of Alexandria from 1854 uh, to 1861 and his reforms. So his accomplishments in the 19th century give way to the education of Coptic clergy and laity in the 20th century. So again, our sources on this period are indeed scant. Um, this period begins to set the tone for the uh, 20th century. Um, the region is beginning to modernize. It's beginning to catch up to the industrialized West and it's beginning to emerge on the world stage. The churches of this region are also catching up um, and their conflicts match those outside ecclesial circles. We can conclude that this age, again, with even with our scant sources is one of transformation. Napoleon did not enter a dark and stagnant country, but one in the middle of transformation and one where its Christians were left to navigate this new modernization process. Um, in the Egyptian context, we can see that Christians drove this transformation. In that process, however, they would challenge the power structure within the church, um, and this struggle would rear its head in every consequent age, and that's also something that we will. Um, discuss in detail at our next lecture together.